Hello, hello. Are we? Oh, here we go. Yes. Uh, welcome back, folks. I mean, I feel like we're drifting up quite slowly after lunch. This is the uh, one of the repercussions of eating. We all just kind of want to lay back. and uh, But we've got so much going on this afternoon, so I'm sure the rest of the people will be coming along shortly. We are on to session five of today, which is about... African women transforming food systems. I think this is a very exciting topic. And we're going to be hearing from some leading African women who are taking on the challenge of transforming food systems. Now, we were very much hoping that Dr. Jemima Njuki, chief of the economic empowerment section at UN Women and a recognized leader on gender equality and women's empowerment, would be able to join us. She unfortunately couldn't join us, but we will still be hearing her words in a little while. But before then, I'm delighted to say that we have a pre-recording from the executive mayor of Johannesburg, Dr. Mpofalatsi, which will play on screen. She has the highest elected position in the city of Johannesburg and is also a medical doctor. Please enjoy the video. Thank you for allowing the city of Johannesburg to participate in the food and drink SME supply chain event. As the city of Johannesburg, we applaud this food and drink event as it aims to boost economic benefits for Greater Birmingham and the UK through international trade that supports key UK international policy priorities such as climate change, sustainability and innovation. As I sign this pledge, I would like to reiterate the following. I would like to highlight the importance of the Johannesburg-Birmingham sister city relationship which stretches back to 1997 and is cemented by the City to City Memorandum of Understanding that was signed at a mayoral level. It is also important to note the significance of learning from each other as city to city partners and in this regard our two cities have prepared a joint draft action plan which is awaiting finalization before sign off by our respective city managers. It is vital to note the importance of making a commitment to ensuring food security and justice in the signing of this pledge, hence my commitment to this process. This pledge is significant to Johannesburg as a caring city includes addressing food insecurity. Johannesburg's multi-party government is committed to addressing food injustice and it acknowledges that all our citizens irrespective of status, are entitled to safe, nutritious, and sustainable food at all times, and this can only be done through collaborative partnerships to address the global challenge of food insecurity. Wonderful, wonderful to hear from the, yes, <laughs> rightly so, to hear from the Executive Mayor of Johannesburg, Dr. Mpo Falazzi there. Now, I'm going to read out an article by Dr. Jemima Njuki about African women transforming food systems. In countries where women are most marginalized, discriminated under the law, and where gendered norms prevent women from owning property and resources, people are also the hungriest. This is because gender equality and food systems are intertwined. However, too often, we only focus on the roles that women play in production, processing, trading of food, and in making decisions about consumption and purchase of food at household level. And while this is important, we must also focus on whether the food system as organized, on whether the food system as organized is just and equitable and whether it promotes the empowerment and livelihoods of, and health of women and girls. The UN Food Systems Summit, to be convened by the UN Secretary General 2021, provides the world with a unique opportunity to reframe the global conversation on gender and food and ask the hard questions of how the food system can be structured in a just and equitable way. Reframing gender and food systems. While there is recognition that food systems transformation is a political, economic and environmental issue, 
we must also recognise it as a gender justice issue. Stark gender inequalities are both the cause and an outcome of unsustainable food systems, unjust food access, consumption and production. Tackling gender injustice and truly empowering women is not only a fundamental prerequisite for food systems transformation, but it's also a goal. So, what should a gender just and equitable food system look like? A gender just and equitable food system is one which guarantees a world without hunger, where women, men, girls and boys have equal access to nutritious, healthy food, safe food, and access to the means to produce, sell, and purchase food. It is a food system where the roles, responsibilities, opportunities, and choices available to women and men, including unpaid caregiving and food provision, are not predetermined by birth, but are developed in line with individual capacities and aspirations. It is a food system where countries, communities and households and individual men and women are equipped to produce enough food for their own populations through environmentally sound processes, whilst also being able to participate in gender equitable local, global and regional food trading systems. So as food systems transform, the, global, the goal should be to ensure that they transform in ways that are equitable, that ensure meaningful engagement and benefits to all women, boys, girls, men, indigenous groups, amongst others. Written by Dr. Jemima Njuki back in December 2020. Okay, so I would now like to, well, we've got a panel that's slightly different to how we've been doing it so far because we have two women joining us via the wonders of the internet. I'm sure they will appear online. And we also have Dr. Edna Adan Ismail. Please do come up and join me on stage. Yes, round of applause. And, um, oh, hello, here we go, yes. Wow, we've, it's so nice. Okay, so please take a seat oh. wherever you would like, Dr. You. Edna. Um, so we are going to hear um, from Nzuzu in Malawi and Durban in South Africa. And thank you to Dr. Edna, who is actually uh, stepping in quite last minute uh, into this session. So we will also be hearing you from Somaliland. Absolutely. And um, I'd also like to say this is quite a good moment for me to thank the Wellcome Trust funded Chefs Project for their support for today's event. Chefs is one of the four major interdisciplinary research partnerships in the areas of global food systems and urbanization. And Chefs has actually supported us to collate the evidence which has been used in the Food Cities 2022 partnership, which of course has led to today's event. So thank you to chefs. Okay, let me now introduce my panelists. Now I can actually see them on screen here. You guys can see up here. So that's great. So we have, I would say on stage via the means of the internet, uh, Ms. Balance Faller, who has been working directly with the consortium in Durban in South Africa. She is manager for the Aquaculture Services Department in Ethiquini Municipality. And we also have Miss Catherine Umzamara, Executive Director of Women in Sustainable Agriculture and the Strategic Lead for the Mzuzu City's Food Work. And we also have Dr. Edna Adan Ismail, who is the founder and president of Edna Adan University. And Dr. Edna, you can tell us a little bit more about what you do when we get on to you. So uh, wonderful to have these women uh, in this panel today. Thank you all for joining us. Um, Kathy, I thought we could start with you and just to check you can hear me okay? Excellent. Yes, I can hear you. Well, we can hear you. That's fantastic. Great thumbs up. Okay, Kathy. Um, so you are 
Director of Women in Sustainable Agriculture, also known as WISER, and the strategic lead for Mzuzu's food policy. Could you tell us a little bit about why you established WISER and how women are being included in your plans for Mzuzu? Thank you very much, Anna. Um, for starters, it's WISA, not WISA. It's WISA. Oh, sorry, WISA. Uh, WISA yeah. yeah, so uh, Malawi, uh, being an agri-based economy, has a population of 20 million, about 20 million now. And of these 20 million people, 52% are women. So when we go back to farming, even the villages, uh, statistically, it shows that 56% of women in Malawi are farmers. Of women or, or farmers in Malawi, 56% are, are women. So uh, out of this, I was looking or we were looking at the food insecurity that we're facing in the country, even due to poverty that we have in Malawi, due to uh, the economy struggles that we're going through, of putting all these women farmers, small or big, under one umbrella, whereby we can be able to support each other, whereby we can be able to communicate and solve the problems that we face in our daily life in terms of food security, as also, we can also create our own market within the network that we can form. So that was the uh, major reason why WISA was formed, just to put all the women farmers, especially in the northern region of Malawi, uh, together under the same umbrella so that we together uh, can contribute or can change, can transform or can bring in innovative ideas uh, to food system uh, that we are trying to, uh, to put in place in Mzuzu. So why Mzuzu? When Mzuzu was being formed, um, I, was, uh, I was not introduced to the Food Foundation. By the time I was being introduced to the Food Foundation, WISA was already formed. So uh, when I was introduced, then it was like an opportunity where I already have an umbrella which has female farmers who are also working hand in hand with the city to promote food security. So it was an, it was an opportunity where WISA would, in a way, be a stakeholder or a contributing factor to the food security of Mzuzu because you cannot talk of a city, you cannot talk of food without talking of women. Um, but apart from that, this was also formed to look at how do we tackle some of the inequalities that are there when we talk about agriculture. Uh, from uh, what you read, um, there is a lot of inequalities, especially in the northern part of Malawi where Mzuzu city is, where land is only uh, as a tradition, to be owned by men. And where livestock, especially beef and cattle, uh, are supposed to be led by men, not by women. But now, because we've come together, we have more power, we can have a voice where we can talk and when we can deal with these inequalities in terms of the food system. Because when you look at the food system, from production to consumption, women are involved, 100%. So that's the more reason why we formed WISA. And as a women that are in Mzuzu City, it was only proper that we are part of the Mzuzu um, Food City strategy. Mm, thank you, yes. So, so interesting that such a huge percentage of the farmers there, are 56% are women, and by bringing them together in, in, in WISA, it's, I guess it's, it's like strength in numbers and the confidence because you have the support of each other to actually raise your voice, ensure the voice of the women farmers is heard and therefore can instigate change. Thank you so much for that. And uh, Balance, so you're the first aquaculture specialist I think I've ever met, so that's cool. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about your role and your work and I've also heard some incredible things about the community gardens project that you support. So if you could tell us about that. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so firstly, within Etiquini, within Durban, we are farming tilapia, but aquaculture in general is like farming of aquatic organ um, organisms, including oysters, mussels, 
So in some cold terms, when I explain to people, I would say that aquaculture is farming of everything that you find in, you know, ocean basket or whatever. So yes, um, and how we assist our farmers, we are currently with aquaculture, we are currently supporting um, 10 aquaculture farmers and we commissioned for them very extensive low tech uh, fish ponds where we give them fish, um, 100 fish as a startup to grow uh, further into market size, whether for consumption or for market purposes. And we train them on how to take care of the fish and we provide them with feed and also teach them how to manage the whole aquaculture systems. And we've been, I've been involved with um, 500 communal gardens that we are assisting as the municipality. And with them, we provide them with um, a whole lot of support in the form of infrastructure, including fencing, irrigation systems, storage containers, seeds and seedlings, as well as training and mentorship throughout the running of their programs. And this helps them to first attain food security and make um, income from selling their produce. So with that, noticing that there's like a whole lot of challenges, including market, as well as um, availability of arable land, we recently launched one home, one garden program where we teach people to um, cultivate crops within their backyards. So it doesn't matter the kind of um, space that you have. We encourage using absolutely anything from containers, tires, old shoes, whatever, and even pellets to grow crops in their yards. And we do, we encourage vertical gardening as well, where um, people are able to, to become food secure just from growing crops. Because um, we've learned that just because you do not have enough land or to form a cooperative does not mean that you cannot be food insecure. And as the municipality, like very cross-sectional, and we've been working with various entities, including um, NGOs, such as Southern African Food Lab, where we teach people how to prepare nutritional meals from um, an encouraging consumption of leafy greens. Because we notice that sometimes a lot of people do not want to uh, consume nutritional meals on, and maybe it may be because they don't know how to prepare them, not that they're not really that nice. So we try to engage the nutritionists, the, di uh, the dietitians, um, as well as like various chefs. So there's a study that has been conducted in collaboration with the University of Stellenbosch and we've been having nutritionists who are actually teaching people how to make meals and that um, we involve as well the ECDs because we believe that studying them at a young age people will actually be acclimatized to eating um, leafy greens or nutritional meals. And it doesn't come to them as a surprise when they're grown because sometimes learning when you are older becomes like much difficult. Like if you're used to eating meat throughout and somebody comes and introduces spinach, for example, um, food may become boring, but if it's something that you introduced as, as at a young age, you become acclimatized to it and maybe food may become boring without veggies. Yes, um, I love and, and it resonates with what we heard um, earlier that it, part of what you, you're doing there is encouraging people to use the spaces that they have around their homes to be able to grow some stuff for themselves to increase their food security. But it's also such an empowering act to grow something yourself if you're you know, not necessarily a farmer and know that you've grown it yourself and then in your, your, you're being able to feed yourself and your family. So that's really wonderful to hear. Thanks for that, Burns. Um, Dr. Edna, hello. Hi. Nice to have somebody here on the stage. Such a shame these two couldn't join us, but lovely to have you with Thank us. You. Thank um, you. It would be great if you could tell us a little bit about what you do and, and your thoughts about African women transforming food systems, please. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to Birmingham. I'm a Londoner, but I think I am uh, very, becoming very attracted to, uh, to Birmingham, <laughs> to the great work that you're doing. And, um, well, I'm from Somaliland, and just to put things in the right perspective, I'm from the former British Somaliland Protectorate, which is a neighbor of former Italian Somalia. Uh, I'm a country that is as big as England and Wales combined, with a population of about five million. It's bigger than 18 countries in Africa. But it's also a country that has 850 kilometers of coastline 
on the Indian Gulf, on the, on the Persian, uh, on the uh, uh, Aden, Gulf of Aden, at the mouth of the Red Sea, which is one of the most um, environmental marine, uh, with the most marine resources. That being said, Somaliland is also one of the poorest countries in the world because we have had many years of civil war, and to keep our country safe uh, and stable, and keep piracy and terrorism and fundamentalism away, we spent 40 or 50 percent of our revenue just to keep the country safe. Um, we have a government, democratic government. Seven presidential elections have taken place, uh, a House of Parliament, a, a Senate. All that has attracted foreign investment. Foreign is investment, Berbera, the port of Berbera, has in, enjoys half a billion dollars of investment in its development because we have a neighbor, Ethiopia, 120 million people who are landlocked who depend on the port of Berbera. This development has also attracted British investment. And the Berbera corridor, the road from Berbera to Ethiopia, is being built by British taxpayers. Now, this explains to you how peaceful and stable Somaliland is. Now, for development to take place, education must take place. Empowerment of women must take place. Women involvement and contribution must take place. And that is why, when I retired from the UN 25 years ago, I went home and built a hospital and then built a university. And today, 70% of my students at the Edna Adden University are women. We now have women surgeons. We have women anesthetists. Of course, we have women nurses and midwives. We have women uh, lab technicians. We have women bankers, lawyers. And these are the skills that we want to encourage. Because without these skills, others take advantage of ignorance and teach our young people how to sell drugs, how to stick knives into the sides of people, how to encourage terrorism, and my, our way to fight all these unwanted, um, antisocial, dangerous activities in our youth is to encourage education. And that is where we extend the hand of friendship to the world and to Britain. Because Britain being part of the, Somaliland being part of the British Empire, the only Victoria Cross medal awarded to our heroes in Africa during the Second World War were awarded to the Somaliland of military. So we have fought in Burma, we have fought in, 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 in Waterloo, we have fought in the Second World War. Our sons have given their lives to protect British, British Empire, British democracy, and freedom of expression. And today we expand that hand of friendship to the world to invite them to Somaliland. Come and work with us. Teach us how to th do things better, how to produce our own food. 850 kilometers of coastline has a great potential for marine development, fishing industries. Don't sell us canned tuna and sardines. Help us how to fish on our coastline and develop an export of these commodities and feed our people with, with those resources. So women, that is where I come in, 70% of our students are women. And when yesterday, several decades ago, women were not encouraged to go to school or learn to read and write. Today, we have women professionals who win scholarships, who win awards. And I just came back from Harvard University a couple of months ago, where one of our former graduates earned a master's degree with distinction from Harvard University. So teach us how to do things better and help us teach our women and our youth to contribute to the peace and stability of the world, 
the peace and stability of the Horn of Africa, to the continent of Africa, and to learn from each other. To learn how to do things better, to fix things, not to, them, not to break them up. So this is the message I bring from Somaliland. And, it's, and it's, as its first uh, young person on a scholarship in 1954, sent to Britain on a scholarship to study nursing and midwifery. With that knowledge, I went home, and this is what I'm doing now, building hospitals, building universities, training health professionals, and also have a department of agriculture and veterinary health, where I need knowledge, where I need people to come and help us teach. We have created an environment that is conducive for economic potential and development. And that is the, the, the invitation I send to the world. Link up with us. Let us learn from you. And learn from how we have kept Somaliland peaceful and stable for 32 years. So thank you for this opportunity. And thank you for recognizing the worth and the role of women in the development of our small little planet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Edna. A really impassioned uh, speech there and uh, wonderful to hear what's happening in Somaliland and that percentage of women students, 70%, that's incredible. Absolutely. And also to hear about the natural resources of the country that aren't yet being um, tapped into, that's I guess, yeah. Should I mention the world's biggest gypsum deposit in the world is in Somaliland? second only to the gypsum deposits in Canada. And we have mineral resources, we have oil, we have gas, and we have 80% of our land is arable land. So it's flat land. It can be made into a food basket mm -hmm. for many countries in Africa, but teach us how to do it, show us how to do it, work with us. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much. On the point of African women transforming food systems, a question to all three of you. What role would you say that men specifically play in improving gender equality and women's empowerment when it comes to transforming food systems? Shall I take it? I, I, I think men... Um, you see, I don't like to encourage um, a position of confrontation. I think we need to recognize the need for partnerships between people, between different genders, between people who have the same vision to move things in the same direction, in the direction of progress. So the role of men is not to become tired of us, you know, f carrying the flag for women's equality, we have equality, but give us the opportunities. Give us the opportunities to work alongside you. It's not a question of you or us. It's a question of all of us together. Give us that opportunity. Mm. So thank you. Thank you. Balance that. <laughs> Balance, I think you were going to say something. Um, actually, I, I totally agree. Um, men need to give women an opportunity to, to take charge because that is how they will be empowered. The, the women's inclusion in the socioeconomic empowerment does not only help them um, acquire income for themselves, but it also enhances their economic independence. They will be able to be independent if we are given the opportunity to be able to empower ourselves without being micromanaged or not being trusted enough to be able to, uh, to do things by ourselves. There's an African song that says, which like means that you strike a woman, you strike a rock. And by saying that, it actually just um, goes to show that women are very resilient and they are actually can be able to stand on their own if they are provided an opportunity and, and trusted to do so. I love that. You strike a woman, you strike a rock, which uh, is very evocative of how resilient women are. It's about giving them the opportunity so that they can just get on with what they're good at doing. 
Um, Kathy, I have a question for you. Uh, what, what would you say are the main challenges faced by women smallholder producers? Numerous problems, uh, especially in the Malawi setting, and especially in Mzuzu, so many problems that uh, smallholder women are facing. Uh, first of all, I mentioned about land. Uh, in our culture, women are not given land. Uh, uh, most of the, of the farms are, are father how, fathered households, whereby the males uh, dominate the land that women have. Apart from that, poverty is the most uh, biggest challenge that we face, for example. Um, 51, 50, 50%, no, 51% of the Malawi population lives below the poverty line. Uh, and we're talking about smallholder farmers or small farmers, they're all in the village. And most of the women farmers cannot even, have, cannot, cannot even afford to buy a pack of seed to grow in their fields. So poverty is the biggest challenge that we have. But also, um, we lack training on best farming practices. Uh, people just farm anyhow, especially women, we would love to be, that's why WISA was formed, so that we can come together, so that our capabilities from one person to another can be shared and we can learn from each other how to base a farm, how to best raise our chickens, our goats, our cows. Uh, capacity building is what we're lacking. But also, um, we need to be empowered by the men. You asked that question about men, what role that men play. Yes. We need the men. For example, I'll give you an example. We are the electors of WISA, two are men. But we are talking about a women organization, but it's also we need the input from men. We can't fight this battle of food insecurity in isolation without the men. When we talk about gender equality, we talk both 50% men, 50% women. So together we can all fight this battle. And yes, we have so many challenges. And we are here, thanks for this platform, because this platform is where we're looking at how do we tackle all these challenges. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I guess it's, it's about encourage. like everybody should be a feminist, women and men. And so it's, it's great to hear that you have some members of uh, WISA who are, are men, that's fantastic. I have another question. What are the main differences between male and female farmers in terms of how they farm and actually what they do with their produce? Like, is there a difference with what, uh, when men farm and produce produce, what they do with it compared to the women? Yes, there is a difference. There is a huge difference because a woman is a mother and a mother looks even after the male themselves in the house, even the husbands. Most, especially where I come from, most of the male farmers are drunkards. So they grow what they grow, usually they sell and they go and drink. While a female farmer, she will go to the farm, prepare the food, and sell a little bit of it if she has excess uh, uh, crops, and take care of the family, even paying school fees, even buying clothes for the same husband that she has. Yeah, so interesting. I guess when, um, when you have women farmers growing produce, more of it kind of stays within the community and within the families. Uh, but when the men, when the men uh, grow stuff, a lot of it gets sold and therefore leaves the immediate area. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Um, that went so quickly. It was so wonderful to have all three of you here. Um, thank you, Balance and Kathy, for joining us online. I know you were hoping to join us in person. We're, we're so sorry you couldn't be here, but so thankful you were able to join us. And Dr. Edna, what a, what a pleasure to have your voice in this as well. Um, please, round of applause to the panel. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks so much.